may be seated, everyone. Aren't you looking forward to seeing Jesus one of these days? And that day, listen, that day may be right upon us. Yesterday, Iran attacked the nation of Israel. I hope that you are praying with us for the nation of Israel, for God's protection and his peace. Israel is God's beloved land. God loves the whole wide world, but he has a special plan for Israel. And he has spoken from the earliest days that God will bless those who bless Israel and will curse those who curse Israel. And so we are standing today praying that God would protect the nation of Israel and would save people all over the world. Would you say amen? These are critical days in which to live. I want to urge everybody in the house this morning to be ready to meet Jesus. The most important thing you could ever do in life is receive Jesus, the Son of God, as your Lord and Savior and be ready when it's time for the Lord to call you out of this world. We want, listen, we want to be ready. Could you say amen? amen? We're going to continue today our look at prevailing prayer. Keys to making our praying especially powerful and effective. And we've looked at a variety of qualities of prevailing prayer over the last several Sundays. Last Sunday morning, we talked about praying thankfully, about weaving the spirit and the voice of thanksgiving all through our praying. How many of you know that before we ever ask God for one thing, we ought to acknowledge all that he has already done for us? Would you say amen? And a spirit of thankfulness in our praying will change our prayer lives. This morning... We take a look at the power of praying with spiritual partners, prayer partners, praying for other believers and praying with other believers in spiritual agreement. We've been launching off every Sunday from a scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 where the Apostle Paul writes these words, night and day we pray most earnestly. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul does not say, although on other occasions he may do so, but in this particular case, Paul says to the Thessalonians, we are praying for you. We are praying. When Paul writes 1 Thessalonians, he's writing about the year 50 AD. He's writing from the city of Corinth, and he's writing alongside two very important ministry partners, Silas and Timothy have joined the Apostle Paul on his missionary crusades. And the Apostle Paul, as he prays, is joined by his prayer partners. And they are praying together for the church at Thessalonica. Paul knew there is power when we pray together. This morning, I want to do my best to abbreviate as we think about what it means and what it looks like and the power of praying with spiritual partners. We begin this morning by examining a couple of practical priorities given to us by the Word of God as it relates to prayer partners. The first is this, we are called by the Lord to pray for one another, to lift up one another in prayer. Galatians 6 says we are to carry each other's burdens. Let me look at me, everybody, and let me tell you a secret. The Lord can do more for your friend than you can. Are you here? Sometimes we want to do everything we can to help someone we love. Let me just tell you, the Lord can do far more for them than we can. And so as we carry each other's burdens, one of the primary ways of doing that is praying for one another. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. We're called to pray, I believe, for individual fellow believers and for bodies of believers. When I was a student in Springfield going to seminary and driving back and forth to Springfield, Week after week and day after day for a couple of years, I made it my ambition. Now, this is because, uh, how many of you know I passed probably dozens of churches on that drive? 
But when I passed one of our own churches in Assemblies of God Fellowship where I knew the pastor and I knew some of the people, I made it my ambition never to pass by that church on the highway without praying for that local body of believers. I believe when we're called to pray for all the saints, we're to, we're to pray for individual believers whom we love and know, and we're to pray for bodies of believers. And James chapter five, verse 16, teaches us that we are to pray for one another so that we may experience the healing power of the Lord. We heard the testimony this morning from Brother Scott about the healing that the Lord worked in his life last Sunday morning. How many of you are glad that Jesus is the healer today? Say amen. Brother Cantor is here this morning. Brother Cantor knows he's a longtime pastor. He's retired. He might be one of the boldest among us. And so when the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, go pray for someone, he steps out and prays. But that privilege belongs to every Christian believer who will listen to the Holy Spirit and step out in faith and pray for one another. And so we are called to pray for one another and we are called to pray with one another. Jesus said, and this will be the most familiar verse of scripture along these subject lines that we could look at today. Jesus said in Matthew 18, again I tell you that if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. We'll talk a little bit more about that verse in a few moments, but let me just say that Jesus taught us that we are, we are to pray for one another and with one another in spiritual agreement. Some practical priorities. Pray for one another, pray with one another. Now let's take a few moments to look at some powerful partnerships in Scripture where people prayed together and God moved. How many of you love it when God moves in a mighty way? Well, the scriptures are filled with stories of how God's people prayed together and the Lord moved in a mighty way. Let's think about five particular contexts briefly. First of all is the story of a military conquest, okay? The Old Testament nation of Israel was marching toward the promised land and literal enemies, military enemies would come out against them to make war against them and God helped them. One of those famous battles was a battle between the Israelites and the Amalekites. And we read that story in Exodus chapter 17. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered and Moses, Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Now this is a great story. The Israelites go out to fight against their enemy, the Amalekites. And Joshua, the young man, is leading the army on the field below. Now this story has a lot of sermons to it, I can tell you. One of the sermons is this. When you get old, you might do some different kinds of ministry. Are you here? You might not be able to be on the battlefield below fighting with a sword in your hand, but you can be on the top of the hill praying. Are you here this morning? And so Joshua is, is leading the battle below and Moses, the old man, go, although I wouldn't have wanted tangled with Moses, but he was the old man. He goes on top of the hill and he's stretching his hands toward God in prayer that God will help the Israelites as they fight the battle below. Have you ever known anyone who was in the middle of a real battle in life? Huh? Were you praying that God would help them to fight that battle? Moses is up there. He's stretching his hands toward heaven. 
Let me tell you that we believe in lifting our hands toward heaven to bless the Lord and to praise the Lord and as a sign that we are reaching toward God and our confidence is in him. How many of you need something from the Lord today? Say amen. All right, if that's you, lift up a hand real quickly and hold it up. Just stretch it up as high as you can stretch it for a minute. That that is a sign that our help comes from the Lord and we are stretching to the Lord. Okay, so Moses is holding his hands up in prayer, but his hands become weary in the middle. It's a long battle. His hands become weary and the Bible says as he lowers his hands, the enemy begins to win the battle. When he lifts his hands, the Israelites are winning. When he lowers his hands, they're losing. So two men, Aaron, Moses' brother, and Hur, Moses' friend, they move their way up to that mount uh, beside Moses, and each one takes a hand, and they lift up his hands toward heaven so, so that he doesn't have to bear the burden of prayer alone. He has, he has two men on either side of him lifting his hands, bearing the burden to the Lord, helping him to reach to the Lord. And the scripture says Moses' hands remain steady till sunset and the Israelites won the battle that day. Uh, Listen, a tribute to the power of united prayer and to the power of God. And in the end of that story, we find that Moses builds an altar and he names it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. And he says, I'm building this altar because hands were lifted up to the Lord. And the Lord brought about the victory. A mil- Listen, many battles are won because believers join together in prayer. And God moves. Look at the second example from Scripture. It's the example of a miraculous cure coming to a crippled man when people gathered together. Here it is. It's in the ministry of Jesus. Mark chapter 2, some men came bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get into Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. End of the story, verse 12, the man got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So here we have a story of four friends gathering around a crippled man, picking him up, taking him over to where Jesus is, a picture of prayer, because how many of you know when, we, when we're praying, we're, 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 we're going to Jesus? So they take the man over to where Jesus is, When they get there, there's such a crowd there, they can't get the man into Jesus. You know the story. And so they go into what I call desperate mode. Is there anybody here today, you have been praying about a situation, but suddenly it seems that things take a turn for the worse and you go into desperate mode in your praying. Not that you're, I'm not saying doubtful mode, but I'm saying determined, desperate mode. How many of you know what it is to switch into high gear in praying? Yeah. If you don't know, maybe you ought to learn how to use the clutch and the gear shift and switch it. Listen, shift in to high gear when it comes to calling upon the Lord. The Lord loves that kind of praying. And these four men tore a hole through the roof and they got the man down to Jesus and their combined efforts in getting to Jesus resulted in that man receiving a powerful, miraculous cure that day. He was healed and restored. He got up out of that place. He walked home and everyone was amazed, declaring, what a mighty God we serve. Now, in all of these stories, hear me, In all of these stories, the power comes from God, not from the people or the prayers. But God has designed things and has desired that we go to him in prayer and in confidence and unity. And so when we pray, the mighty God of heaven begins to move. All right? So a miraculous cure comes. I could tell you countless stories about people in our church who have experienced sicknesses and troubles and diseases and the church went to prayer and God moved and helped as a result of 
of God's people praying together. A military conquest, a miraculous cure. Thirdly, as we talk about prayer partnerships, is the story of a mediating congregation. This is a congregation where one of the members falls into great need and the congregation gathers and goes to prayer. All right, let's think about it. It's Acts chapter 12. So Peter, the apostle Peter, was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now, let me back up and tell you. A few days earlier, James, the apostle, was put to death by King Herod. Herod executed James the apostle, the brother of John. And then Peter's turn was coming. And the church thought Peter's head is on the chopping block. And really it, it, it was in a sense. James was executed by Herod. Now it's Peter's turn. He's about to come to trial before Herod and the church says, we, we, don't, we, we can't let this happen. We, we're going to pray, 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 pray for God's protection for Peter. And they gather together. Look at it there in verse number five. The church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly... An angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. And that angel delivered Peter from prison that night. Peter, verse 12, went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people, everybody say many people, where many people had gathered and were praying. What were they praying for? They were praying for Peter to be rescued from prison and delivered. And guess what? As they were praying in that house, God dispatched an angel to the prison cell and Peter was delivered by an angel. Now listen, when we pray to God for his help and his deliverance, we don't always know how God is going to get the job done. Look at me and listen to me, everybody. We don't have to figure out how God is going to do it. God knows how to do what he's going to do. And they prayed for Peter to be delivered. And guess what? God dispatched one of his mighty angels and Peter was delivered from prison that day. Don't you know they had a house party when Peter showed up that night? Praise God. A mediating congregation. I want you to know when a church determines to gather together and pray in faith and determination and confidence and unity, the sky is the limit as to what God can do. A military conquest, a miraculous cure, a mediating congregation. Fourth is the picture of a ministry cooperative. Now, I won't take time to read the scriptures and elaborate upon this one except to say that the apostle Paul prayed for his church people But in the same breath, he asked his church people to pray for him. Okay? How many of you know the preacher needs prayer too? The pastors need prayer too. I have prayed countless times in my life for many of you, for you church people, for all of you collectively, and for many of you in the midst of specific situations, I have prayed for you. In turn, countless people in this church body down through the years have prayed for me over and over and over again. In the first service this morning, as I was walking out, Brother Herb Chapman, one of the longest members of our church family, been a member of our church family since around 1950. Brother Herb Chapman met me at the post back there and he said, Pastor, uh, Pastor, you've been going for a long time. Keep on going. Keep on going. I said to him, Herb, I'll remind you of what Sister Vera Frazier used to say when I'd visit her in the nursing home 25 years ago. I'd say, Vera, keep serving the Lord. And she'd always say, I didn't get in to get out. Yeah. She'd also tell me one other thing every time I left the nursing home. She'd tell me, stay out of jail, pastor. (laughs) A word of encouragement I was determined to obey. (laughs) 
And she'd say, I didn't get in to get out. Herb said that back there at the post today. He said, keep on going. Can I tell you that Herb Chapman has been praying for his pastor every day for these last 30-some years. He's been my prayer partner. I could take anything to Herb Chapman, and he would, with all sincerity of heart, go before the throne of God. I have confidence in his praying. I have confidence in his spiritual life and his walk before the Lord, and I treasure the prayers of God's people. So we need each other. The last example of a prayer partnership in Scripture that we'll look at is the picture of a missionary collective. All right? It's in Acts chapter 13 where a church has been planted in the city of Antioch, Syria. And it's a booming church. I mean, it's, it has started off with a bang and it is growing and thri- it is a major... I believe the church at Antioch was the fir- apart from Jerusalem... Outside of Jerusalem, Antioch, I believe, was the first international megachurch. And they began to grow mightily. And they had some powerful leaders. Two of their leaders were Paul and Barnabas. How many of you know that would be a good pastoral team? Okay. You've got Lowell and Bob and Peter and Deanna and some of the others. They had Paul and Barnabas. And it was a powerful church. And they were a praying church. And look what happens as they're praying together one day as the church is going. Acts 13, verse 1. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod and the Tetrarch, the Tetra- and Saul, that's the apostle Paul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, everybody say while. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. What's happening? You've got a praying church in Antioch. You've got prophets and teachers and prayer leaders in Antioch. They are praying and worshiping and seeking the Lord together. They're even fasting on this occasion. And what happens as they're in the midst of one of their services? The Holy Spirit speaks. Now, we don't know exactly in what format the Holy Spirit spoke. He may have spoken through a prophet in the midst of the body. He may, because God can do anything, he may have spoken out of heaven. Although I personally believe that the Holy Spirit spoke through someone, through one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit speaks out a specific word of direction for that local church. What's the word? I've called Paul and Barnabas to do a special missionary work. Get them out of here and send them off to do the work that they're supposed to do. And listen to me, that church service changed the world. Because Paul and Barnabas set out at the Lord's command. And over the next number of years, Paul, along with his ministry teams, would, tr- would, would travel around the known world of that day and would preach the gospel and plant church after church after church after church after church. And the world would be reached with the good news of Jesus Christ because a local church in Antioch was praying and the Holy Spirit spoke a word of direction. That's powerful, isn't it? That's powerful. I don't know about you, but I want to be that kind of church. Don't you? Everybody say, Holy Spirit, you're always welcome in this place. Listen, I know, I know we're living in a day and age now where many churches, even that call themselves charismatic or Pentecostal or spiritual churches, are shutting out the voice of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the operation of, of the gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> because listen, many times people would rather have a polished service than to allow the Holy Spirit to move in the midst of the service. Listen, we reject that idea. We want the Holy Spirit to be present and working and moving and we want Jesus to be Lord in this place. Could I have an amen? So listen, we're not gonna, we're, we're 
not going to shut out those kinds of things. You say, well, doesn't that sometimes kind of jumble up a service? Yes, but let me tell you, the Lord knows how to jumble up things and get the job done. And, and as the church prayed together and welcomed the work of the Lord, the world was changed. All right? So we see these examples of powerful partnerships when people prayed together. So, and, and we, we've looked at, at, at large church groups. We've looked at armies. We've looked at a few people praying together. The point is God has called us to pray with others and for others so that our prayers might reach him in a, in a different kind of dynamic. All right? Practical priorities, powerful partnerships. Let's look then at some prevailing promises. These are very simple, but they are very important. Two principles. One, your prayer agreements will be powerful. Let's read the verse again we started with this morning. Matthew 18, 19, Jesus says, again, I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Now, look with me. Pause and think about this. Obviously, our prayers have to meet the criteria of Scripture. We have to be praying in the will of God. Could you say amen? We have to be praying in faith and trusting the Lord. We are called to, to pray what God wants us to pray. So this is not a blank check for anything that somebody who doesn't even have a heart for God wants to pray about. Many people pray about things and they never see any result. It's because they're not praying in the will of God. They may not even really be the people of God. Okay, so, but Jesus clearly is teaching us a principle here and that principle is this. As my people, Jesus says, I want you to pray together in spiritual agreement. That's my plan for you. And your prayer agreements will be powerful, says the Lord Jesus, and God will hear and God will work. Your prayer agreements will be powerful. The second promise is this. Your prayer assemblies will be powerful as well. And look at the scripture. We'll read it again. Matthew 18, 19. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Now, how many of you believe that where the Lord is, anything is possible? Okay, so the point Jesus is making is this. You're gonna be praying together and you're gonna be gathering together in my name. You're gonna be living there under my lordship. You're gonna be worshiping me. You're gonna be praising me. You're gonna be praying for things that are important and dear to my heart. And as you pray together, I'm going to be there in your midst. Your prayers are going to be powerful and God is going to work in your midst. And he's going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So listen, listen, do me a favor. I know we can't have a church service here without saying the name of Jesus 50 times. That's just who we are. But let me just encourage you. Every time you come to church, when you walk onto this property, when you walk through those sanctuary doors, would you just do me a favor and say, I'm here in the name of Jesus. I'm here in the name of Jesus. I'm here as a follower of Jesus. I'm here with faith in Jesus. I'm here as a child of God. God and we're here to do business for Jesus we are gathering in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ the name that is above every name and we have full assurance and full confidence that the Lord our God is going to be present with us today and he will accomplish what he wants to accomplish listen Jesus is here right now Jesus is here right now Am I rejoicing that our brother Scott was healed last Sunday? Yes. yes. Am I shocked by that? No. The Lord is here and he is able. So as we pray in agreement, whether it's in the sanctuary or in your home <coughs> or in your Sunday school class or with a gathering of prayer partners somewhere, as you pray together, I 
urge you to pray in agreement in faith and trust the Lord and know that the Lord our God is a mighty God as we come before him. Amen and amen.